Hello everyone, a good day. And today we are going to have a new set of topics for unit two and we are done with sound devices. So we will move to the another literary device. We are going to focus on the figurative language. Allow me to share my screen. So I hope you can see this screen. So our lesson two for literary devices. So we have figurative language. Now we're learning competencies. So we do have two competencies that we need to realize for this topic. First one is to identify the figures of speech and other literary techniques in a text and explain the use of language in literature as well as the formal features and conventions of literature. Moving on. We also have two objectives. One, identify the figurative language in the text, which will be realized in, a, in this recorded video and use figurative language in your own writing that will be realized in the assessment task that I will be giving to you at the end of the discussion. Our essential question for this topic, how can figurative language affect the meaning of a text? So how can a figurative language affect the meaning of a text? Now I know that most of you we're able to encounter the different sets of figurative language or figures of speech that are being used in literary texts, be it in short stories, be it in drama, be it in poetry. So it is being used to provide visual imagery for, for the aesthetic uh, features of literary texts. Now let's get this one. And with our literary text reading, we will have these five unlocking of difficulty words so to enrich our vocabulary, not for real, necro, so clammy, bio, and layette. Okay, so we have here car bills, an elegant basket of flowers used for courtship. Example, young men and women of high social stature would customarily not marry until the husband to be could present his intended bride with a court bill. So it's a, it's a basket. We're in flowers, so we put them there and to be offered to uh, his bride to be. Negro is a dated word for black people. Now it's actually offensive, discriminatory. In other side of the world, they are considering this word as a taboo. And you can actually go to jail if you're going to use this one. So an example sentence, many old stories written during the time when slavery was still prevalent referred to black people as negros, a term which is now a racial slur. Next word, calamity, unpleasantly damp and cold. He was so nervous while waiting for his turn to deliver his speech that he kept wiping his clammy hands on his head. So wherever we feel nervous or anxious or something like when we're going to speak in front of a lot of people, sometimes we have clammy hands. It becomes wet. And that is an indication that you are a bit nervous or something or anxious. Bio is a partially outlet near rivers, lakes in southern USA. So uh, if you're going to go to a river bank, there is a, a, a specific location in there where you there is where he has a marshy outlet, and that is called Bayou. An example sentence for this one, watching her adventures through the bios of New Orleans was a novel experience for people outside the USA. And last word, like that, sets of clothing and linens for infants. So for my baby shower, my grandmother sent me a beautiful layette she had preserved since my mother was still blanket, clothing, and linen for infants, usually being used when we carry the infants in. You know, they're a bit fragile, not a bit, but they're really fragile, so you need to put some clothing or linens for their skin to be not rocked directly with other people. 
some um, not so soft objects. Okay, so those are our words for today. We will be encountering those in our literary text for your further reading. So in this way, uh, your vocabulary is enriched. So it, it will be added to your vocabulary. Now let's move to our discussion of the figurative language. So we have here some words that are being used. So we have analogy, cliche, and connotation as our first set of figurative uh, words or language. <clears throat> analogy is a comparison that presents the similarities between two concepts or ideas. So basically, during assessment, we can also find this one. So it is an analogy wherein you are going to see uh, the features that are similar to these two concepts. Another one is what we call cliche. Cliche is a word, a phrase, a sentence, or a whole text that used to be perceived as clever but has become the code. So basically, cliche are actually a painting of a big impact, lines that create big impact, or it has uh, some, you know, catchy notes. But then it became a cliche because of its utilization, repeated utilization. So somewhat like you're using it most of the time, people are using it most of the time, it became a cliche. Another is connotation. Connotation is the secondary or suggestive meaning of the word. So the symbolic meaning of the word. One that is not its literal or primary meaning in the dictionary. So basically when we say connotation, it is beyond the literal meaning or the surface meaning of the word. So symbolic meaning is actually connotative in nature, right? So suggestive meaning. This can be contextualized. So there are words that are having uh, variations of meaning according to context, okay? And that goes in the connotation. Another is euphemism. When we say euphemism, it's used to substitute for a description that is considered harsh or blunt. So basically, euphemism uh, is being used for us to be able to tone down somewhat like a brutal or maybe a harsher words that are very emotive in nature. Say, for example, when uh, we say uh, his father passed away, instead of bluntly saying, his father died, right? So that is euphemism in nature. Hyperbole is a gross exaggeration to achieve an effect, usually for humor or emphasis. Say, for example, um, you are waiting for your friend to arrive because you have transactions or maybe you have some uh, somewhere to go with them and you're waiting for quite some time. You would say to them that you are there for... 10 years already and still, still no trace of your friend. So that's a, an exaggeration in nature. Like, yeah, you've been there for a couple of minutes, but you've said you've been there for 10 years already, right? Another is metaphor. This is direct comparison where we do not use like or as to compare two unlike things. And Comparing these two seemingly unlike objects that have similar or common characteristics with the use of like or as. So for example, my mother is a tiger. So you do not use like or as, but there is now a direct comparison between your mom and a tiger. So maybe they have shared the same characteristics, like they're very strong. Or I don't know. So that's metaphor in nature. Another is metonymy. The same metonymy is a word or phrase that is substituted for another that is closely associated to it. Now, when we say metonymy, this is a representation of something. Say, for example, a uh, crown representing the Queen of England. Say, um, for example, a representation of uh, bravery, say, sword. So there is a symbolism in there. And uh, mm, uh, pen is mightier than sword. Okay, this is actually a famous line by Osiris Roberts. 
it's a representation of our wisdom or our words sometimes are much more, much heavier can impact compared to our strengths, right? So that's autonomy in nature. Oxymoron, it's a combination of two ideas that appear to be opposite or contradictory. So two words are being put together and it seems like they're seemingly contradictory, but it makes sense. Say, for example, deafening silence. So deafening silence is an oxymoron or a bitter sweet, right? So it seems like they're contradictory, but yeah. They seem to appear contradictory, but they make sense. They make you know uh, suitable pair you know, to to create impact. It's oxymoron. Paradox, on the other hand, sometimes they tend to be you know, somewhat. Students are quite confused. What's the difference between paradox and oxymoron? So paradox, it's an assertion that seems to be contradictory. So it, you can see they share features or silly that actually reveals some truths. So for example, you will say, uh, if you're ready to live, then you're ready to die. So it doesn't make sense at all. But if you're going to look at the sentence or the phrases involved in this line, yes, they make sense, right? So that's paradox. Another is parasitification. It's a statement when an animal, object, or abstract idea is given human attributes or characteristics like the sun is smiling at me. Flowers are dancing, like daffodils dancing in the sunlight. Those kind of lines are actually personification, wherein we could see that we have given human attributes to anonymous, anonymous object. Okay. Another one is simile. Simile compares two seemingly unlike objects by using the words like or as. So this is somewhat like um metaphor in nature because we're comparing two unseemingly uh, objects but they share common characteristics but this time around in simile you make use of the words like or as so she is as shining as the stars in heaven that is simile all right another is significant used when a part of something is used to represent the whole or vice versa so synecdoche is uh, a representation or uh, I ran out of words, you know, it is a part of a whole. See, like for example, her parents have given her new set of wheels for her graduation. Wheels in there is not literally the wheels, but it is pertaining to a car. Um, why you say do not have a roof to stay in for tonight it means you do not have a house or a dwelling uh, for you to be able to you know shelter you from cold tonight so that is a bit the key in nature okay so it's a part of the whole so lend me your ears the ears representing the whole you you're just using this one to represent uh the process of listening okay? so that is a bit the key right so i guess these are just a part of this very long list of figurative language. I hope that you were able to you know, review your knowledge, your prior knowledge, or your experiences with figurative language, because we will be using that one in our activity. So we'll have assessment tasks where we are going to come up with different lines using figurative language. So as a recap, we have civic to keep, simile, Parasitification, paradox, oxymoron, metonymy, metaphor, hyperbole, euphemism, connotation, cliche, and analogy. So, for a very short review of what, uh, what is your prior knowledge with regards to those sets of figurative language, I would like you to read this race baby by H. Chopin. So I'd like you to read this one and try to see it, identify the different figurative language used in this literary text. So basically, this is mm, the literary text. I will be sending to you the link for this one. Maybe you could have a review of this prior to our next discussion or next talk. Okay.
okay, that's it. I'll be sending to you this link. And we have here a series of questions, guide questions for us to be able to really have a deep comprehension or understanding with the text given to you. Okay, so I'll stop my presentation now. And just give me a moment. I'm not being trying. So I'll stop my sharing and that's it for our next uh, literary technique. So we have discussed how devices learn a figurative language. The next time around, we are going to have another topic and we will be focusing on give me a moment. same it's literary techniques and <clears throat> literary techniques and devices. We would like you to have an advanced reading for this one. Okay. So other literary techniques. So we will be focusing on other literary techniques and to be highlighted in our next discussion are the following terms. <clears throat> Allusion, allegory, dichotomy, juxtaposition, and the happy prince by Oscar Wilde. So we will have this, that discussion next week by Monday. Right? So thank you for being with me today in this in this pre-recorded video. I hope you were able to grasp. The, I mean, that's just a review of what, what was being given to you in your previous subjects because figurative language I can you know, repeated subject. So this one is for you to be able to enrich your knowledge with the different figurative language. So if you do have some concerns, please do not forget to comment in our comment section and kindly share your insights with regards to figurative language. Why figurative language is essential in understanding literary text. Okay, that's our question that needs to be answered. So comment down below in our comment section your response to this essential question. And that's it. Thank you so much. And we will see each other again next meeting. Bye-bye.